All right, guys. Good morning. Um, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to continue looking in Ephesians and uh, in the last session that I did, I skipped ahead and went went a little ahead of myself because actually I'd forgotten about this particular part <laughs> of the of the lessons. So we'll go back, and uh, that's a good thing. We can always go back. Me, I seem to go back a lot and repeat myself, but either way, it's always good to repeat sometimes for me if nobody else. Um, we've been in Ephesians 2 for a while, and what I've been doing in the last class, is, I guess the one before the last one here, but in the lessons that I'm doing in Ephesians, um, I was looking at the connection between what Paul says in these verses, and probably it's good to just go ahead and read these verses at the beginning of Ephesians 2. And it says, this is verse 1, and you, now the King James says, hath he quickened, but actually in the original, that's not there. He's not bringing in the good part yet. In the beginning of this chapter, he's showing them the miserable state that all men were in before the grace of God appeared and showed up. And he says, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. If you want to look at that, the children of disobedience, we did that already in some lessons, but the children of disobedience, not just a bunch of disobedient people because they can't get themselves correct or right. It's about nature. He's going to say here, by nature, children of wrath. But if you want to talk about obedience and disobedience, where seems to be the whole division between good and bad, good and evil, good Christian, bad Christian, or good Christian, not a Christian, whichever. We do good, we do bad. Disobedience and obedience seems to be one of those things that we always focus on. So everybody's trying to be obedient to God. And how do you obey God properly? And all these things seems to always lay on our shoulders for some reason. The problem is if you go to Romans chapter 5, there is a real perfect understanding of obedience and disobedience, and that has to do with the disobedience of one man. Many were sinners. And the obedience of one man. Many are made righteous. What does that do? Well, that just puts a hammer directly into the skull of the, of the debate. Who of you are obedient? The grace of God is not that he gives us the empowerment to become obedient people. He gives us the life of the one who was obedient, even unto death. He gives us the righteousness of the one who is made to us obedience. That's the whole idea of obedience is better than sacrifice. That does not mean you know, what many have taught. It's actually looking to the cross and say the obedience of that one is greater than the sacrificing of animals. And the Because, you know, that's when Saul came back and they were like, we're going to take the best, which God said, destroy it all. And they brought back what they deemed to be good and said, we're going to sacrifice it to God. We're going to give it to God. That's what we do, right? We're going to give it to God and God doesn't want it. God's got what he has, and God, he has what he wants, and he's given it to you. He's not looking to you for anything he wants. He's given to you all that he wants. That's grace. That's kindness on the part of God. So that's who he appears to, those who have no ability in themselves, who are dead in trespasses and sin, or children are the offspring of disobedience, you can say. Among whom also we had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, meaning we're all the same, even as others brings that in. It's kind of like he says in Romans 3, there is no difference. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. 
there's a particular verse I've been looking at lately. I think it's first or second Corinthians four. Let me turn there real quick because this is a beautiful verse. Um, Yeah, here it is, 1 Corinthians. And this has to do with the grace of God and the, 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 the living, abiding efficacy of the life of Christ that has been given to us. And I want you to re- just listen to these words. This is a rebuke that Paul has given to the Corinthians. And it is a rebuke to them. And one of the most beautiful things that he has written, period, in any of these letters, when you think about it, just, just it's beautiful. Um, verse six, we could start at the beginning, but I'm for time. These things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Here's the the verse. For who maketh thee to differ from another. There's other translations that says, who has succeeded any superiority to you? Who makes you superior over another? Now, he's rebuking Christians who would compare themselves among themselves and say, I'm, I have this, I have this gift, I have this thing, I have you, what you don't. When This comes on the heels of him saying at the end of chapter one, this is all of God that you are in Christ Jesus who is made unto you. And this rebuke is in the line of that saying, for who makes you to differ? Who makes you superior over another? For what hast thou that thou didst not receive? What do you have that you did not receive as a gift from God? Now, that's something we all as Christians need to chew on for a moment. We need to understand who he come to. We need to understand our state when he arrived. And we need to understand and think very carefully about this question. What is it that you have that God did not give you? That you did not receive from him alone as its only source? What a question. And now, if you did receive it, why do you glory? As if you did not receive it. In other words, as if you earned it. As if it came as a payment for your services rendered. That's not how this works. God has given to us all that we have, and we have nothing except what God gives us. In the sight of God, what he demands is what he provides. And thank God he's provided it to the souls that have believed. And that is what he's talking about here. You were by nature children of wrath. As everyone else, he could say, but, verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved, because that parenthetical statement is basically defining what's happening. This is work of grace by which you're saved. It came to the dead, those who were weak, those who had no strength, as it says in Romans. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so according to that, we've been looking, and this is just getting us started, but we've been looking at the parallel between what he's saying here and Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37 being believed by so many to be 
a picture, a prophetic picture of the natural restoration of, of Israel. Well, it's about the restoration of Israel, but it's about the resurrection and the full giving of life to the true Israel of God. To those who were dead, bones that were dried up. And this is the work of salvation. You can futurize that all you want and miss the point. This is a work of salvation where the Spirit of God comes and indwells these bones and they stand as, a, as an army before God, as having one life of the Spirit entering into them. What a beautiful thing. And we're not going to go back and rehash that part, but there is a second part to the story because it carries through. That prophecy is not just about them given life. It's about the, the whole point of it was about creating one nation, one people. And this is what Paul's getting into in chapter 2 of Ephesians when he begins to tell about the Jew and the Gentile being reconciled in one body through the death of Christ. How they have been reconciled by the cross, made to live by one, one new man now, both Jew and Gentile, but not defined by either Jew and Gentile, defined by one life, the life that fills that church with his own fullness. I mean, this is, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, salvation, that 1 Corinthians 15 expresses that the first man was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit, a life-giving spirit. And it speaks of that moment, the twinkling of an eye moment. Now, I'm always taken back to things like the picture of Jesus healing the woman that had the issue of blood. And there's other places where it says the same thing, but there, it's very specific there when the, when the woman comes and touches Jesus. She was unclean. She was not even supposed to be out in public. But she knew that if she could touch him, that's all it took. Just to touch Jesus is all it took. And, and the beautiful part is when someone would let, when someone with any kind of thing, unclean, in any way ceremonially, when they would touch you, guess what happened to you? You became unclean too. But guess what happened to Jesus? That didn't happen. See, our uncleanness does not transfer over to him. That's the beauty of it. That's what I mean by he doesn't have to have us keep him, he keeps us. We don't have to protect the seed, he protects us. He holds us in place because we don't have a clue how to do that or the capability if we had a clue. There's an anchor holding us in heaven itself and that's him standing there. So this twinkling of an eye when he when she touches Jesus it says immediately the issue of blood was dried up immediately it says it two or three times immediately it happened that's salvation just like that and we're about to talk about something that is in Christianity today that doesn't believe the immediacy of salvation the immediacy of righteousness the immediacy of justification the immediacy of perfection being the state of the believer not because the believer does anything to qualify for that state, but because the presence of Christ brings them into it by imputation, Paul calls it, imputation of righteousness. It's a work that God does. We've got to understand, we're not as in control as we like to think we are. We love to think we have power in this. Guess what? You don't look. You were dead in sin. These bones in Ezekiel 37, you think they could have stood up eventually after some evolution of time? No, oh, they were dry, dead, dried up, bleached out. It has to be a work of God doing this one thing in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that's the sounding of his voice, the Son of Man shall speak and those who hear him shall live. The trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. That's what this is addressing. Brought from corruption to incorruption, from a corruptible seed to an incorruptible seed. That's a new birth. That brings you from one birth to the other. This is the putting on of Christ where he would go on and say, death is swallowed up in victory. 
See, this is the beauty of salvation, and this is the thing I miss so long. That the moment Christ comes to live in my soul, guess what my soul is a partaker of? A once and for all eternal victory that has been wrought by God and not by me. And I can fight imaginary battles for the rest of my life, and God's already won the only one that matters. And he has bestowed to my soul the victory he has won by bestowing to my soul the one crowned with honor and glory, having won the battle. Where is your victory, O grave? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. There's, there's the lauding now. Thanks be to God who gives us this victory through Christ. There's Romans 7 and 8 right there in a, in a picture. And we, unfortunately, so many futurize that and say, won't that be wonderful? Well, yes, it will be when you finally realize it's already here. But it's wonderful already because your soul abides in the surety of that, even when your soul is ignorant of it. When you're ignorant of the surety God's brought into your soul, guess what? The surety is still there because it's of God and not of you. None of this is about us. We don't have, like I said, we don't have as much power as we like to think. Of God. This is a work of God. This is done of God. And this is shown of God. What are we? Recipient. Vessel. Vessels of mercy. So in Ezekiel 37, we'll look a little bit at some of the things we looked. He said, Ezekiel 37, verse 11 through verse 14. He said unto me, this is after he showed them uh, the valley of bones. And he says to him in verse 11, then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost and we are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy, the word there could be preach, declare, say unto them, Thou saith the, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves. What we just say in 1 Corinthians 15. Grave, where is your sting? I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and you shall live and will place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it again. Here is the prophecy culminated and shown to be fulfilled both in, the, in Ephesians chapter 2 with what we read earlier and 1 Corinthians 15. It is coming out of the graves, coming out of death, having his spirit enter into us and give us life. There's the beauty of it. And in so doing, the hope that was lost now comes to abide in the soul as a present, perpetual, abiding reality. That's Christ in you, the glory hoped for. There's the hope that seemed to be lost. But he came and brought it into the souls of men. This is the victory that we have received. Now, to compare to that is Isaiah 25, verse 8 through 9. We're going to go to a few verses, so. You can write them down or flip to them. Verse 8, he will swallow up death in victory. Sound familiar? And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off of their faces. And the rebuke of the people shall be taken away from off the earth, for the Lord has spoken it, and it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God, we have waited. There's the anticipation, the expectation of people waiting for their Messiah, waiting for the salvation of God to finally come. We've waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This, again, 
It's a beautiful depiction of what God has wrought, that which was awaited, that which was promised, now come in this death being swallowed up in a victory wrought of God. Do you see how weighty these things are when we see them as a present tense reality and not a future tense? We understand what we stand on is very sure, very certain, because it was real before we arrived to it. That we didn't make it better or make it worse. We have no power to do either. And God brings us in. It's just like Abraham put Abraham over here to the side, let him see what's going on, but God himself, the pot and the torch, cut a covenant with himself. He didn't have Abraham lagging along and bringing him by the hand and saying, you got to do this too. No, he said, you watch. And the, the fear and dread of darkness came upon him, but God was cutting a covenant and so answering a question, how is this going to happen? How is this promise going to happen? I have no ability here. My wife is barren. None of this. This guy in my house is not my heir. How is all this going to happen? Well, the answer is I'm going to do it myself. This is a covenant I'm cutting with me because I'm going to take my side and your side and make sure both sides get done. That's what a covenant is. I'm going to take care of it. I, if I cut a covenant with myself, guess what I know? I'm going to take care of both sides of the picture. I'm not going to lean on you to, make, to keep your side of the bargain because you can't. And God knew that when he called him. God wasn't caught off guard when he found out that Sarah was barren. There was a purpose to show you nothing I demand, nothing I promise will be from you. Nothing. So who does he come to? He comes to that type of people because there's no other type of people to come to. <laughs> Dead. Nothing. First Corinthians chapter one just brings it out clearly. You a Jew, you a Greek, doesn't matter. You know what that means? You're nothing. The weak things, that's who he came for. God, why? Because that's all there is. There is no strong human in the things of God. Poor in spirit is what you are. But when he comes, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because you've just hit the jackpot. Because what you couldn't do, I am. And I've come to you to give you what you can't be and be in you what you can't do. No wonder he says, oh, the love of God that has been extended toward us, the richness of this mercy. We ought to know that. Christians need to hear that. See, my experience is most of you here was like, I didn't know there was more. I didn't know there was anything. You know why? Because most of us, all of us, didn't hear it. We never even heard it uttered that there was something greater than just forgiveness of sins as we thought it to be. God's forgiving you your sins now. Good luck. You better not mess up again. Hopefully you make it at the end. Most people live there. We didn't hear it. That's why the gospel and the preaching of the gospel is important. The foolishness of preaching is ordained of God. Because we need to hear it to give our soul an orientation and give the spirit of truth something to work with. If all I'm getting is a bunch of deception and lie, where am I going with that? All the things of me and is about me and how good I am, look, he came to this. He came to dead people. He came to people that had no hope, no ability, and guess what? That doesn't change. He just overcomes that weakness and provides to you himself. Treasure in the vessel never change places. It's always the same. But the vessel now has a treasure abiding in it. That's the beauty of it. And can boast 
in that. You ever tried to boast in the vessel very long? Last for a while, maybe. Some longer than others. Depends on how much strength and how obnoxious we are most of the time. We really think we got it. No. Even when you think it, even when it looks like it, doesn't mean anything. Because reality, as far as God's concerned, is an unseen reality. It has no natural, visible evidence. As he says, the kingdom of God doesn't come with ocular evidence or observation, as it says in King James. Ocular evidence is not the way you see the kingdom or the things of God or the things of the kingdom or spiritual fullness. You don't see it that way. And that's all we do is look there to find it in ourselves, especially. But look at this. This is a picture too of what he's saying in Ephesians. And hopefully we'll get to where I'm going. I've got about 30 more minutes. Psalms 51. This is the picture of David repenting and Showing something here that I want us to consider. Behold, verse 5 of Psalm 51, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. See, that's at the very start. He's not even pointing to what he just did and the sin he just committed. He's pointing all the way back to his conception and saying it was all downhill from there. It started out sin. And it continues sin. That's just the way it starts. Well, that's the same with all of us. We have the commonality of corruption all among us. High fives all around. That's what we've got. That's what we're working with. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidward part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Notice he's calling for another to do this. Wash me. Purge me. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. It's kind of the same picture. Hide your face from my sins, blot out all my iniquities, and create in me a clean heart. It goes into what we'll look at in Ephesians 2 where he speaks that we are the workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit. That's a spirit of freedom if you look that up, a free spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your spirit from me and restore to me the joy of salvation, of your salvation, that's important, and uphold me with your free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from my blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And listen to this phrase, because this is something I want to stick on for a moment. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Look at that phrase. Thy righteousness. And we could begin, and we're going to, right here. And this may be where we end, I don't know. A short discussion. That's been debated for a long time. And some don't even know this debate exists, but it does. Some don't even know they believe this particular thing, but they do. Because they would swear that they believe something else, but they actually believe this other. And that is the difference between imputed righteousness and infused righteousness. Have you ever heard of infused righteousness? Infused righteousness, imputed righteousness. It's actually a debate in Christian. Catholic Church is actually where infused, the concept of infused righteousness come from, but it didn't stay in the Catholic Church. It has permeated all through the church. So we're going to look at that difference and see the distinction and why it's so important to understand it. Why why all that Paul says in chapter 3 of 
Romans leads up to his discussion about Abraham and a righteousness imputed to him in the midst of his inabilities and weaknesses by faith. He believed God, and it was accounted, imputed to him as righteousness. And that's important to understand. This is the... So, again, most of us are unaware that this is even a thing, but it's true. And most people actually preach and believe in an infused righteousness. I remember, who was that? Watchman, not Watchman, Witness Lee. He was a guy kind of around the time of Watchman Knee and all that. But Witness Lee was a guy, he used, I think he coined the phrase, mingling the mingled spirit. It's kind of the same thing in a way, where there was a mingling together of the human spirit and the spirit of Christ, the salvation. There's that mingling. He has a translation of the scripture that he uses that quite often in his books and commentaries, a mingling of the spirit. Well, it's a mangling of the spirit, if you want to ask. It's a mangling of the gospel is what that is. That's a totally... Wrong view, but we want that because an infusion implies something that imputation doesn't. So the word infuse is in the Hebrew or in the in whatever language, it actually means to pour into. How many of you have, have seen or the illustration of the the glass on the the table and somebody would pour water in it and they'd say, this is the spirit of God going into the vessel. And man, I don't know how many times I've seen that forever. And this, you know, God fills us up and fills us up. And then finally it's overflowing. You're like, yeah, that's what I want. And he just keeps pouring it in. But the problem is when we, when people teach an infused or poured into righteousness, they don't do it that well. They don't just say, hey, he's just poured it and it just stays poured and the water never runs out. He's like, he pours in a little bit and then he stops. And then it's up to you. There's an initial pouring in or infusion of righteousness. There's a given portion or a seed that is initial. You ever heard of we receive him as a seed and then he grows? It's the same idea. given in portion as a seed that after that initial act is now done, now the responsibility is on you. To do what? Well, to cultivate it, to nourish it, to extend and, and give some zeal toward it. So what? I can qualify for another pour. They always say, you know, in the when in where I was, they would preach it as we need another filling of the Holy Ghost. Right? We need another filling. We need to get filled up again. Your sails, you, you know, your sails now limp. You need to get the wind back in your sail. That's, I mean, all those terminologies that we use. Well, that's something of infusion. So we have to do these things, get, get prepared, get all this zeal, this exercise, all these secondary actions on our part to qualify for another poor. You can see it. Righteousness is poured into us and we are responsible through our living, through effort, zeal to be entitled to another infusion until finally, in any given time, and most of us it's forever and ever, the infusion is finally done. But guess what happens? The infusion never quite gets done. It's always going on. So, this started, again, as I said, in the Catholic Church. Thomas Aquinas actually said this, justification implies a movement toward righteousness as heating implies a movement toward heat. You ever heated your house? So you tell people, I'm heating my house. And you know, that takes time if your house is cold. 
takes time to heat it up. There's a process. The heat has to displace the cold. All that has to happen. And so you say, I'm heating, and that implies heat. Well, one day or at some point in time, that house will be fully heated. Well, it's the same thing. Justification is a process of where you're saying, okay, I'm moving toward becoming righteous. That's infusion. That's how it's taught. Not only Catholics, but Christians everywhere teach it and believe it. This infusion does always make the man the one who dictates the level at which the infusion is given. We dictate it. Our works, our efforts, are you good enough? Have you done enough? We are the ones that dictate the level. Whether you understand this or not, this is commonly held as truth. This is why so many live with an insecure and uncertain perspective regarding their condition before God. Because they're always in need of another infusion. They're always in need of a little more Jesus. I prayed for more of Jesus for decades. Because I'd look at me and I'd say, well, apparently I just got his foot. I must not have a lot of him. So I need more of him. But how does that fare in the light of in him you are complete, rendered full? Now I can understand comprehending the fullness that he is in me, but having that fullness is a different thing. And most people don't understand that's, that's the state, complete. And then upon the basis of complete, we can say, now, let's see Jesus. And then you're not shaky and wavering around, wondering, am I good enough? Have I done enough? No, he did enough and he's good enough. And that's all there is. And that's all that's needed. And that's all God expects. He expects his son to be perfect. And guess what? He is. And that's why he gave you his son. He didn't give you instructions. So this infusion is proportioned based upon some existential, secondary performance on our part. People live and die in that insecurity. I always bring my grandmother up because she's the one primarily that I knew in that way, knowing a woman that was faithful, sincere as you could ever imagine. 90 years old, born again when she was in her 20s. Prayed hours every day. She loved to tell you how long she prayed, which was just some, some part of it. But prayed every day for hours. And at the end of her life was wondering if she'd done enough. Because her body broke down and she couldn't do it anymore. She just couldn't do the stuff. And that's always the question with me. When it's always about me doing and me being and all the stuff. Even with the manifestations that I'm supposed to be manifesting to the world. You wonder, okay, when this body breaks down, when my mind breaks down, and I don't even remember my own name, let alone you. What happens then? What good is your body now? Where's your doing now? When the body's gone and all you have, then what? What good are you? You're the same. You're as good as you were. You're a vessel indwelt by the fullness of Christ. You're a vessel indwelt by the treasure because it never has been dependent on you. Your body didn't matter. You did stuff, good for you. We all do stuff. Thank God we can. And thank God we have been called to do things. But the doing of things and the things that we do means nothing in the economy of eternity. It means nothing. The sufficiency of Christ is all that matters. The fullness of the one who fills us is what matters. And God calls us to know the fullness that he's provided. Calls us and says, now, behold 
my salvation. What a joy then. You can actually, as David said, I will be glad and joy in your righteousness, not mine. That's what we want. We want to get to the point where we can boast and rejoice in our righteousness. But the whole thing is about us finally realizing it is not I but Christ. And we can boast in the righteousness of another man that has been imputed and bestowed to us as our only life and righteousness before God. And then, so again, this misunderstanding of infusion and portioned out righteousness and justification that we receive from God based upon ourselves and based upon our deal. And this is how, again, we have people in Christ who still live in that panic, wondering how they, because they are at least honest enough about themselves to a degree, how can I stand before a God that is demanding perfection? Whether in this body or out of it, how can I possibly stand before God who is perfect? Because according to this, they've not reached the end of the infusion. They have not because there's some kind of hindrance or a multitude of hindrances to reaching that end. Things I haven't overcome yet, right? I'm still trying to overcome this. But that's okay. God overcame it. When he came into you, he overcame it. He overcame you, period. So what's the imputation in the picture? What's the distinction? It's a word that means to reckon or to account to or give to someone's account. It's an actually accounting banking term. It's an accounting term that speaks of funds being given from an, an account that has an abundance of supply to an account that is innately insufficient. The richness of his mercy, doesn't that make sense now? The abounding and abundance of him giving to the nothing and insufficiency. Like, I used to get those checks, right? I used to get checks that said non-sufficient funds. <laughs> and I was working in a finance office and I would get them back and say non-sufficient funds. I knew what that meant at least, working in the business. Yeah. Well, guess what? We were born in SF. But guess what? The grace has appeared and bestowed to us out of his abundance that which we were insufficient of, that which we had none of or hadn't had, didn't have, say it that way. This is why it's important to understand the distinction made by Paul with the treasure in the vessel. And I know I bring that up a lot, but it's very important. The treasure and the vessel in which the treasure is bestowed. There's always a distinction. God ordained a work in order to show the continued distinction between the imperishable treasure, which in another place he calls gold and precious stones, and the weak and perishable, that clay earthen vessel, wood, hay, stubble, that thing that is perishing, that thing that is not eternal. And a remarkable aspect of this is the immediacy of the state reckoned to us by God. Righteous. Moment, twinkling of an eye. It is done. Why? Because he's here. See, he can't be present in a place and that place not take on the nature of the one present. We might want to think about that a while. When we're looking in the mirror, maybe we want to see the other man in the picture and let that man determine in our sight as he has already in God's sight our state before God. It has been reckoned immediately. Paul's state righteousness as the direct result of the imputation of another man's perfect life given to us. That's in Galatians chapter 3. And this is not progressive at all as infusion is. 
The imputation of righteousness has no progression to it as to the getting it, attaining it. It is immediate. It is one-time transaction. That renders the soul in which it takes place complete, perfect, lacking nothing but an understanding. Just an understanding of what God has wrought in it. Just a comprehension of the gift that God has provided. But notice there is from that moment always a conditional clause that defines complete. There's a clause. There's a condition in him. Complete in Christ Jesus. Made us to be the righteousness of God. Oh, thank God. No, no. In Christ Jesus. He never says anything positive toward the vessel without putting a conditional clause in it and saying it's because it's in him. Because he determines it to be so. That's the certainty of it, and that's the immediacy of it. For it to be progressive, he would have to need it to be progressive. For it to be immediate, he's the substance of it provided. Which one do you think it is? Like I said, he didn't climb into me foot first and get in there piece by piece. He came in in all of his glory, all of his beauty, and all of his fullness. That's the whole church. That's why there is a church filled with the fullness of one man, not progressively getting filled with his fullness. And it brings us to another point when we understand imputation and the source of that internal bestowal of all spiritual blessings and the sufficiency of it, the sureness of it before God always belongs to the one who gave it, always. And I want to. I want us to see that it never becomes mine, so that I can glory in it and boast in it because I deserved it and I worked for it. You tell people your righteousness is a bunch of junk, and guess what? They'll want to fist fight you. You know why? Because they work hard for that tell you right now, I build a building, you burn it down, we're going to fight. Well, the truth burns down our stuff that we build because if he didn't build the house, we labor in vain, right? Well, buddy, we've been laboring in vain for a long time trying to build something God already built. He's already done this. And yet we live in the illusions and the vanities of our mind and we are content with it. But the gospel comes and just says, no. The simplicity of this is it's him, not you. It's nothing but him. This is the whole thing. But we see Jesus. That's simplicity. Uh, They saw no man but Jesus only. That's the simplicity of the new covenant. And, but the simplicity of it is what makes it so secure. When you add the complexities of this man, that man, this work, that work, you have just complicated it. When God says it's him, and nothing else. That's pretty simple. And it's pretty stern. But it always belongs to him. Of God, not of us. It's always his. We don't claim it. It's never our property. It's never ours. We just receive it as a gift. And he keeps his hand on it to make sure it stays there and make sure it's secure. See, what that means is he didn't give us something from himself and say, here, you can have it too. And that's how we do it. He gave us righteousness too, so we can be just as righteous as Jesus is. That's what is preached today. We can be just as righteous, just as perfect as Jesus is. You see how that little twist, and it doesn't seem significant at first until you realize it is. That is very significant to say, I'm just as righteous as Jesus. No, Jesus is my righteousness. That's different. Because the one says, it's mine now. I can claim that. The other says, I'm boasting in the fact that he has made unto me all things. It is his, not mine. 
Righteousness is his. It's just given to me as a gift. But it's not him giving to me something separate from himself. He is the one given to me. And he abides as the reality that my soul truly possesses before God. Do we grow in that understanding? Oh, absolutely, forever. But that reality does not grow in us. We grow in the understanding of it. When that reality came and bought and purchased my soul, guess what? It was full, complete, just like he says. You're in a state of fullness, meaning that you are full. It says it three times. If you go to Colossians and he says you're complete, read it in the Weiss translation one time. He says complete, full, replete in 40 different ways just to make sure you got it. You are in him in a state of fullness, meaning that you are replete and filled full. Got it. But that's not of you. And it's not because you deserved it. And it's not because you will. The treasure in the vessel, there's that distinction that will always be there because God wants to make certain that the vessel can have one ground of boasting and that's the indwelling of a treasure. Again, reckon to us the person himself abiding in us as the gift imputed. Note again the phrase, my tongue shall sing aloud, boast, and give glory of your righteousness. Man, what a change. What a beautiful thing when I can release mine and boast in his. That's the good news of this. Romans 3 speaks of the same thing. In the coming of Christ, would God set forth to be the propitiation? It says to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. To declare at this time I say his righteousness, not yours. It's to declare him righteous, righteous and his righteousness and that he might be just or the just one and therein the justifier of those who believe. He had to be that first. He has to be that solely and eternally. He has to be the one that God raised up as a man. Death has no hold on. The law has no claim on. Who God says, perfect. And now all men can come to him and be found in the perfection that he is in the sight of God. And therein, when his righteousness is declared and his, just, his justification is seen, that he is just before God, righteous before God, perfect before God, he is therefore the justification of those who are found in him. He's not, he, he does, he's not the leader of the pack. You know, he's not the first in line and then we come up to and the whole time we're shaking a little bit, hoping that we're just as accepted as he is? No, you're accepted in the beloved. Again, another qualifier, right? Another conditional clause. It's in him. Thank God. Now, I have five minutes to start something. We'll, end the, we'll go in our, the next time I do this. And these are just a bunch of, well, there's a bunch of verses I'm skipping right now because I want to get to, oh, <laughs> I don't want to skip any of them. But when you go to Hosea 13, and you go to verse 14, 15, 16, all those, speaks of this beautiful salvation. I think it is Hosea. 
Their dead bodies shall rise with my dead body. Chapter 6. Yep. Now we're not going to touch that, but I it's in here, but I'm I'm wanting to get to something else right now. But I want you to look at that because it's the same picture as Ezekiel. It's the same thing as Ephesians chapter 2. It's all the same. It speaks of the resurrection. It speaks of all the, all the things that we've talked about, basically saying it verbatim. But I want to turn back to Ezekiel 37 and let's look at something else because, again, this gets to the second part or, or the other part of Ephesians chapter 2. And the next time we'll may cover what I was just talking about, but I want to at least get this out there. Ezekiel 37, verse 15. This is after the bones are raised up and stand filled with the Spirit. And we'll only be able to read a, a portion of it. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and ride upon it for Judah, and for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another in one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what you mean by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, the tribes of Israel's fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hands. This is Ephesians chapter 2. This is exactly what's happening there with the Jew and the Gentile. And most, most uh, many of the theologians that talk about this says this is what he's actually referring to in a picture. Bringing together, not just Israel as a nation now total, he's showing the distinction between two peoples, two kingdoms. And if you dig a little deeper in the Hebrew, you see that the word stick in the Hebrew is actually tree. Tree, not just a stick, tree. So what is he saying? You take this stick, you take this stick, and then they come together as one stick in my hand. And I'm going to join them as one nation. This is what he says in Ephesians 2. This is the same thing. We'll get into this in a little more detail where he says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off were made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, to make in himself of twain, of two sticks, one new man. So making peace. And this is said in the prophets too, and we'll get back to that next time, but so that he might reconcile both Unto God in one body by the cross. It's the death. He's reconciled by his death, but as he says in Romans 5, justified by his life. Reconciled by his death, justified by his life, regardless of your natural distinction of Jew and Gentile. That doesn't matter here. God's going to bring into one. He's going to make one nation, one church, one body out of this. How does he do that? He takes two different things, puts them into one tree, and puts it away, and he raises up another man. One man. Spirit. That's, that's the picture here in, in uh, Ezekiel 37. I will make them one nation. He keeps on going. I'll make them, and I'll give one king who shall be over them, who shall reign over them. 
What a beautiful picture. This is exactly what he's saying in Ephesians 2. This is what happened, but we have to understand. It doesn't matter whether whether the Jew boasted in their righteousness by the law, the Gentiles, whatever. You know, everybody has your thing when you come in, but guess what? When you come into the door, your thing doesn't matter here anymore. God has taken the two, made them one, reconciled them by his death on the cross, brought the two sticks into one, and made them one nation. And where they used to fly under different banners as two nations, now we fly under the one banner, and his banner over us is what? Love. The love wherewith he has loved us. His mercy and kindness that has been extended to us of coming to the dead, whether they're dead Jew or dead Gentile, it doesn't matter. And here's the thing. The Jew will say, oh, you're just that uncircumcision, and we're the circumcision. And Paul says, it doesn't matter. It's all flesh anyway. They're the uncircumcised. You're the uncircumcised in the flesh. They're circumcised, made by hands in the flesh. Whoopee, do. There's the boasting of men, and it's insignificant. What God has wrought is something that is eternally significant and eternally perfect, and it will never change. So we'll we'll talk about that a little more later. Thanks for listening. Amen.